Good morning, my name is Spencer. I'm Anthony. And I'm Tayu. And welcome to our beautiful home in College Park. We are the Campus Brothers household, a part of the AO Maryland Campus Ministry. And we would love to welcome everyone to the Capitol Rivers Church service this morning. It is a beautiful morning and we are so excited to worship with everyone, hear the messages, and just be so inspired. If you could, please turn your Bible with me to Psalms 23. And it reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for my name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I think during this time, we definitely just need refreshment. Um, I mean, seven weeks in the house with the same people can get old. But um, at the same time, we should enjoy it um, and see it as a time to just get to know one another more, um, learn new things about the people that you see every day that you just never have the time to get to know. Um, and I think that's been the case here in this house where um, we're spending 12 plus hours a day together. Um, and so it's just been good to get to know these guys more, um, spend more time with them. Um, normally we're very isolated. Um, we're either doing schoolwork, at work, and we just our time schedules never meet up. But now it's just like we have the same schedule be at home 24-7. Um, and so it's just been great to spend time with them, whether it's watching movies, playing video games, going outside. Um, we bought a mini hoop, so we played basketball on the side as well. Um, and so just getting that quality time has been awesome. And then also uh, challenged me to reach out to people that I normally see every day. So now I have to call them and say, hey, how are you doing? Or text them and check in on them. So it's just been great to really put forth that effort to get to know people and uh, just uphold the relationships I already had. I don't know about you guys, but this whole situation has been such a learning process for me. Uh, in this time where we're self-isolating or even being forced to isolate, uh, it can be really easy to dissociate from everyone. But I just want to encourage you guys to see this time for what it is, a time where we can like, grow closer in our relationships with everyone else. Um, one thing that I've been learning and probably you all have been learning is that tomorrow isn't necessarily promised and we won't always be here so we really need to take this time for what it is as a time where we can really just cherish the people in our lives our loved ones um, family members friends everyone uh, one thing I like about the scripture that Spencer shared today is that is the analogy of us as sheep and one thing about sheep is that we're flock animals. We don't travel alone. We don't live alone. We have all these people with us. So let's not violate that nature. Let's be as sheep are and stay together. Luckily, we have this shepherd in Jesus who is currently leading us through the dark valleys and the scary times. But as long as we keep our eyes on him and we travel together, we'll make it through this okay. So with that, Welcome to the Capitol Rivers Church of Christ. Hi, my name is Ariana. I'm Matanya. And we represent the teen ministry. Please join us in a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for today's service and for building a friendship with us. Protect us from the spouse and give us life. Just by email. Dear God, thank you for letting us be able to be here this Sunday morning, virtually connected to you and to each other. God, I pray that you can speak to us through the lesson and allow the lesson to impact us throughout this week and the rest of this quarantine. Please keep everyone safe and healthy and help all of us to stay strong in our faith. I love you and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Here we are to worship God.
sing this one to God. Here I am. Here I am to worship. Here I am to, to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together, together lovely. You're lovely. All together worthy. You're so worthy, Jesus. All together wonderful to me. King of all days. Let's sing together. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came, Lord. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake.
You're wonderful to me. Good morning, Capital Rivers Church. It's great to be together this morning. I'm coming to you live from Rockville, Maryland. And uh, this morning we're going to continue our study in the book of Genesis. Uh, but I'm going to take us in a little bit of a different direction this morning. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. So you can be turning your Bibles over to Genesis chapter 2. That will be our main text for today. And uh, what I want to talk to us about today is really two ideas. The first is this idea of cultivation. And so the title of my lesson this morning is Cultivating community. Cultivating community. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 4, we read this. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The Lord God made the heavens and the earth, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. 
but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and there it was separated into four headwaters. And of course, the text goes down and explains the names of those waters, and it gives us some other details. And then in verse 15, it says this, The Lord God took the man... And he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. That's Genesis 2 in verse 15. He put the man in the garden to work it and to take care of it. And this is actually the area that I want to talk about with us this morning. So um, just a quick recap. What is this second world that God has just created? So you remember in Genesis 1, of course, there's a long narrative about how everything was created and the order that things were created and the way God did certain things. Here in Genesis 2, as we've discussed a couple of different times, the narrative gives us a little bit of a different perspective. And I've called this sort of the earth perspective or the earth point of view. And so here's what this, here's what this space looks like according to Genesis 2 that we just read. There are no shrubs, no bushes of the field, no precipitation in the rain sense of the word, but watery springs are coming up. So it's a moist place, but it's not a rainy place. The Bible says man is then formed, then God plants a garden, and man is planted, same word, planted in that same garden. Then there's that long description of how rich that place is with water and minerals and ore and precious stones and metals. Then in Genesis 2.15 it says, God put the man in the garden for a specific purpose, to work it and to till it or take care of it, the NIV says. But the word there is to till, as in to till soil. It means to work soil, as in to farm. And so no shrubs, no bushes, no rain, but there's springs and there's a man. God plants this garden, right? Notice Adam doesn't plant the garden. God plants the garden and then he plants the man in the garden and says, you know what, man, you know what your job is? Be a cultivator. Work this soil. Till this soil. All the words that are used there, shrubs, bush, those, those are agricultural plants. And so you get the sense from Genesis 1 that there's this large, prosperous, fruit-filled, plant-filled, garden-like creation called earth. And then somewhere in the center of that earth, there's what you and I would call a vineyard or a garden, something a little bit more designed for mankind. And he says, I want you to till that soil, and then I want you to take care of it, the NIV says. Um, the, the English Standard Version says, I want you to watch over that, or I want you to protect it. And the word that's used there has that sense of to protect or to guard. And so a couple of interesting questions come up here. One is, what is this garden doing kind of in the middle of nowhere? Why is Adam there all by himself? And what was there that needed guarding? Is there anybody else on the earth? I mean, what's exactly happening here? What is Adam's mission? What is Adam's mission? And what I want to suggest to us this morning, that Adam was to cultivate and protect and harvest what God had given mankind, and that our mission actually is exactly the same. That Adam was a cultivator, not a simple farmer, but someone that was to grow and to till and to work the soil to create a place that was safe for mankind to inhabit, where all of our needs would be met. And what I want to suggest again today is that our mission is still the same. It's unchanged. That we are cultivators of God's good creation. So let's back up here a minute and talk about gardens. Now, for most of you, when you think of a garden, you're probably like me, you think of the garden in your yard that's composed of flowers or different plants, or maybe you think of all the weeds that are growing in your garden because of all the rain that we've had recently. Or maybe when you think of garden, you think of vegetables, or you think of work, you think of labor, or you think, oh no, gardens are something that people do out in the Midwest. No one around here has gardens. But in the ancient Near East, right, where, where this text is written, gardens were not just flower gardens. They weren't just for looking at or for walking in, 
but gardens were houses of the gods. Right, that if you look at ancient literature, Mesopotamian literature, Canaanite literature, Egyptian literature, that the gods lived in places that were filled with life, right? That the gods lived in gardens. And in fact, there were garden temples. If you go to uh, Japan or uh, the Far East, even today, you'll find that all of their temples are surrounded by elaborate gardens. If you go to India and places like that, it, the, the temples are filled with images of plant life and all the gods are being fed. And a typical Indian or, or, or um, uh, an altar that you might see over there, there'll be a statue and then they'll be laying food out for the gods, right? So this idea that gods in the ancient Near East lived in places where there was lots of food, that's a common idea. And what would happen in, in ancient Near Eastern culture is the gods would live in these beautiful gardens and the humans would be the slaves, that the job of the human being was to tend the garden to feed the God. But what we find here in our Old Testament is it's exactly the opposite. That humans didn't make this garden, God made this garden. And God doesn't live in this garden, God lives in the heavens, but God made a garden and put man in the garden and God feeds man, man does not feed God. That Adam is, if you will, the shepherd of this garden. He is, in some ways, the priest of this garden. That the Garden of Eden is a divine house filled with food. And Adam's job is to till, to keep, to guard. So you have a human being in a place designed for gods, mediating between everything else that God has created, naming animals, ordering animals, working in the field. What I want to suggest is that Adam is the priest and the farmer of Eden. And of course, this makes sense. He's a keeper of the soil, a tiller of the soil, a steward of the land. That his job is to take the good things that God has given him and, and control them and harvest from them and use them and keep them orderly so that they don't go wild and overtake the earth. I can relate to this a little bit. I have gardens all over my yard. I have flower gardens. I have different beds. And at this time of the year, when the rain really starts to go, um, things grow very, very quickly. And so I pruned the hedges a couple of weeks ago. And as I was walking through my yard late last evening, I realized, man, there's, there's, there's weeds already coming up in the garden. The flower beds are already kind of overflowing. The, the hostas are just aggressively growing outside the borders of the beds. Um, things need to be pruned and trimmed again already. And if I don't stay on top of those things, they get really wild really fast. God didn't sprout a field of vegetation until Adam was there to care for it. The text clearly says there was no man there to till the soil. So God creates the garden and then he takes Adam and he puts it in there. The garden was a gift to Adam. So the Garden of Eden is a community of cultivation. Adam is in the garden to cultivate. He is both the priest and the farmer. Adam is planted in the garden by God. Adam is there, and what is Adam commanded to do? He's commanded to bear fruit and multiply, to till the soil. But he's not just a simple farmer. Again, an ancient Near Eastern garden would contain not only plants, but also livestock and animals, that it's not like a modern flower garden, but this one would have everything in it. It would look more like what we might call a small farm. These ancient gardens were, and in some cases still are, guarded by a gate or a fence. And of course, later in the Old Testament, you see exactly that. But there is no fence in this garden. This is an unguarded garden. And God invites us into it. So what was Adam doing? Was he just there to hang out and kind of take care of it and oversee things? Nope, this is a sacred garden. In fact, when, when Eve comes on to the scene in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 20, after the fall narrative, when Adam finally gets around to naming Eve, he calls her mother of life, mother of the living. Adam and Eve were meant to be co-regents, co-leaders of this beautiful garden. And of course, Adam can't be fruitful and multiply without Eve. Community relationships like this are built for multiplication. So what does all of this actually mean for us in the New Testament? So we have this garden that's really a temple, that's really also a field, and Adam isn't just some guy, but he kind of functions as the farmer and the tiller and the priest, and Eve isn't just some random woman, but she's also the mother of life. 
what does all this have to do with our New Testament? What does this mean for the disciple living in the 21st century? Well, I think it means a lot of things. Many, many times in the Old Testament, you'll see patterns or what the Bible calls types or typologies, images, models, if you will, models of what, what was in the ancient world. And then Jesus jumps off of those exact same models and he instructs us as his New Testament people how to live. That he uses metaphors, he uses models, he uses examples from the Old Testament to teach us really important things about living for him. You and I are also priests. We are also tillers of the soil. Revelation chapter 5 in verse 9 says, They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God. From every tribe and language and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. Revelation chapter 20 in verse 6, talking about the, the, the resurrection, it says, The second death has no power over us, but we will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. You and I, brothers and sisters, were also made to be both priests and farmers. I want to go over to a very important New Testament passage, and let's bring this point home. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John, of course, also wrote Revelation. And so the Apostle John, his writings are rich with Genesis imagery. They're rich with garden and priesthood imagery. It's in John that we find out that there's that long conversation about Jesus in the garden and the, and the prayers in Gethsemane. And, of course, Jesus himself went to a garden and prayed in a garden and was arrested in a garden and then was buried in a garden tomb, right? And we talked a couple of weeks ago about how Jesus was in himself the tree of life. And where we got that from was we got that from John 15, where he says he is the true vine. And so John in particular, and the Gospel of John, mirrors a lot of this Old Testament image. And so let's talk about what it really means that you and I were created to be both priests and tillers of the soil. How is it that we are to fulfill our mission as stewards of the world that God has created for us and put us in? John 4, in verse 34. This, of course, is the interaction with the Samaritan woman. And the disciples, of course, go into the village and, and they leave Jesus talking with the woman. And then they come back out and, and, and they ask him if he wants to eat. And in verse 34, he says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four more months and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They are already ripe. For harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Notice all of the sowing and reaping and garden imagery in this passage. What's the recounting here? That the seed is sown and Jesus says, you know what? My food, what I really need, what sustains me is doing God's work. What is it that fuels Jesus Christ? It's the will and the work of God. Four more months and then the harvest? No, no, no. He says, it's already reaping time. So a little bit about farming in the New Testament, and then we'll close. So again, I think what we tend to think of is farming in the modern sense. You know, I have a, a, an uncle um, who used to work for a company called Northrop King Seeds uh, out in Bemidji, Minnesota. And um, he, he actually owned a farm and had combines and things. This is a long time ago when small farms um, could still be the means for a family to make a living. And things have obviously changed and that business has become a really big business. But he grew up as a farmer and he literally farmed. And I have been to his farm and I watched that work. And, and so when I think farm, I tend to think combines and equipment and large, large, huge plots and, and irrigation systems. But New Testament farming is different. The seed was sown by hand. So think about Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. The seed was sown, it was scattered by hand. And then the job of the tiller 
was to go behind the sower and turn that layer of topsoil over so that the seed would become buried in the sand. So they didn't till first and then sow, they sowed first and then they tilled. And what the tilling was to do was to turn the soil over to make sure that the seed could get into that soil and be protected from what? From the birds and the predators being blown away by the wind, being overtaken by the stones or trampled down on the, on the path. Again, think of Matthew 13. And then, and then once the tilling was done and the seeds were scattered, they went away. God, of course, waters, God brings sun, and the job of the, of the farmer then is to basically protect the field from pests while he waits for God to make it grow. Then at the harvest time, they would put the sickle to the standing grain. So here again, they wouldn't take a combine or a piece of equipment, but they had a handheld sickle. And the elders, the older people, would bend over and they would swing the sickle and they would cut those plants off at the root. And then they would leave them laying on the ground. And the harvesting, the reaping, was actually done by the young, by the children and the slaves. And so the sickle was done, the, the cutting down was done by the older adults. The children and the slaves would gather them and take them in big bundles into a place called the threshing floor. Where they would lay them on a large stone wheel and they would run that wheel over them and it would crush them. Then they would take, take that, that uh, combination of husk and dirt and mud and kernels and they would toss it into the air several times in a place where there was a wind and the wind would blow away the lightweight chaff and keep the kernels and the good stuff by itself. And this is called the threshing floor, and that process is called winnowing. It means to sort, and it would be done by the wind using something called a winnowing fork. I'll see if I can put a picture of that in uh, our video today so you can see it. But the most important thing about all of this is that all of this work was done out in the fields. So they wouldn't go to work and then come home, but when it was harvest time, Everybody working on that farm, they would all go out and they would live in the fields, they would sleep in the fields, they would camp out in the fields because they had to protect that harvest from marauders and from criminals and from creatures and from people coming and stealing it. So at harvest season, it's literally all hands on deck and they would sleep out there and they would live and work and sleep and live and work and sleep days, weeks at a time until the harvest was complete. So harvesting was something that had an urgency built into it. Brothers and sisters, the harvest today has an urgency built into it. If we are priests and we are harvesters, how's our urgency about the harvest? How are we doing being fed by the harvest, being fed by the will of God, being fed by the mission of God. What is it that motivates us and encourages us and inspires us? What is it that feeds us? Do we have that sense of urgency that the world needs reaping? The world needs to be harvested. The world needs the good news of the gospel. You know, tending to God's business is an honor. Tending to God's business makes us incredibly special. You know, priests were chosen specifically to make sure that people had access to God. The disciple is a priest chosen specifically to make sure that the world has access to God. Reapers and harvesters were chosen specifically to make sure that God's people could eat and were well fed and were well nourished, and that the goodness that God had brought into their lives through the harvest didn't go to waste. How are we doing as priests, as reapers, as harvesters? Tilling the soil of the human heart is the most important task a human being could ever be assigned. Preparing a world where God would live with us and making an earth that is as it is in heaven. Gardens were the homes of the gods, and it was the gods that ate the blessings and ate the fruits. In our world, gardens are the home of humans, the sons of God, and God does the feeding, and God comes to see, God comes to be with us. I am a priest, you are a priest. We worship at the temple, we maintain the temple of the God who does not live in temples. The church of Jesus Christ is God's temple and we are his garden. 
So all of these images that we see in the garden in Genesis, everything that, that Adam was commissioned to do, that Eve was designed to do, we also are designed to do. Adam was a son of God. I am a son of God. Eve was a daughter of God. You sisters, you are daughters of God. You are mothers of life. Brothers, you're priests and tillers of the soil. The church is the temple of God. Paradise is ultimately a place where God wants us to live with him forever. We need to be active in tilling the soil, active in the garden of the Lord, participating in our priestly duties, our gardening duties, staying active, staying busy, working on the harvest. And you know, I don't mean by this necessarily going out door knocking or evangelizing in the sense that we typically think of. What I mean is that, that harvesting is hard work. Farming is something that we do all the time, consistently, continually, and tilling the soil is something that we do time and time and time again. And then we wait for God to open the heart, open the kernel, open that seed for God to water. But we have to be sowing and we have to be tilling. We have to always be thinking about the harvest. Even if we're not always thinking about a Bible study or always thinking about baptizing someone into Christ, we should always be thinking, what can I do to make this garden more viable? What can I do to keep this garden clean, to keep this garden healthy, to keep this community connected, to help this community grow, to show people what it means to be a priest of the living God? Farming is something that you do in season and out of season. There's always something to do in the field. Maybe you're not the reaper today. Maybe you're the sower. Maybe you're the waterer. Maybe you're the caretaker. Maybe you're just loving. Maybe you're just praying. But are we active fulfilling our mission as the sons and daughters of God, as the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, building a paradise where people can live with God forever? You know, the Lord's Supper in the New Testament is also a feast of harvest. If you think about Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, Pentecost is a celebration of the harvest. And it celebrates what? It celebrates the reaping of the harvest. And I don't think it's an accident that God begins his church in the festival of reaping, in the festival of the harvest. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in verse 26, as Jesus is teaching the disciples the purpose of communion, Paul is quoting Jesus Christ. And he says uh, in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, communion is a harvest celebration. Grain is partaken, wine is drunk, fruits of the fields of those who have worked them. Every week, brothers and sisters, we come together and we hear God's word, we hear good news, we sing praises to God, and then we do what I believe is the most important thing that we can do in any single week, and that is to sit at the feet of Jesus and celebrate the fact that he has harvested me for life, that he has saved me from being burned up in the unquenchable fire, saved me from being chaff. So as we close, I want to pose this question. How do you see the world? You know, I think we tend to want to see the world as this, this place that's broken and, and, and terrorized by sin and a place where temptation lives and a place that's broken and a place that's overpopulated and overcultured and overharvested and overworked and mankind is somehow hopelessly destroyed. And yet, it's the earth it's a garden. It's this world that God uses as the template to describe our future state. It's this world. It's gardens. It's, it's not some far away, mysterious cloud world, but it's a garden. God says, I want to give you a garden. I want to put you in a home. I want you to feel the cool soil under your feet. I want you to taste that delicious food. I want you to grab someone by the arm and say, I love you. I want you to experience physicality. I want you to experience glory in the garden, not in some faraway diminished place. 
And when we talk about outreach and when we talk about evangelism, when we talk about sowing and reaping, we're not promising somebody some future, distant, maybe someday hope and wish on a prayer, wish on a star hope, but it's a real, live, living hope for that the life and the love that we experience right now, we can experience forever. We're not meant to go away from this place. We're meant to redeem it. We're not meant to rip people out of the world, but to show them how to overcome it and redeem it and enjoy it for something that's beautiful that God has made for us. So as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper and as we celebrate the Feast of Harvest, let's stay busy in our own gardens, faithfully tilling the soil, spreading seed, watering our relationships, cultivating a fruit that will last forever. Amen. Thanks. Good morning, guys. I'm Peyton. This is my mom, Adana, and we're here to share communion with you guys. So I'm going to start by reading uh, Luke 23, verses 20, uh, 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our sins deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so I share this scripture um, because we're living in a very tumultuous time with this pandemic and um, this thief on the cross, the one that actually was like, you know, Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom, at least he was um, in, a, in a tumultuous time as well. And so there wasn't a whole lot of hope and um, there wasn't a whole lot of resolution. Um, he, he was there, he was going to die. That was the only sure thing that he was sure of that he was going to die and who knows what was going to happen to him afterward but then Jesus comes in and is his hope and rescues him and um, you know Jesus says truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise and um, I just love that because um, especially in this time that we're living in our hope is Jesus um, and we can trust him to rescue us and to be our resolution, to be the solution to whatever we're going through. And so I, I just wanted to encourage you guys with that. And so mom's gonna share now. Hi, I'm mom. All right, so uh, we're reading um, the Women's Ministries reading, um, He Chose the Nails. And the last part of chapter six says, and when one prayed, Jesus loved him enough to save him. And when the other mocked, Jesus loved him enough to let him. He allowed him the choice. He does the same for you. And um, the thief about the cross, we don't know his name. We don't even know what, what crime he was accused of. But one of the things we do know is uh, he was being punished. And he could not be rescued from that punishment. Okay. He knew he was going to die. Um, and never see his family or loved ones again. And we also knew that he was desperate because he reached out to Jesus in his last hour. And I am so much can relate to that thief because I was he. Uh, before I was rescued from Jesus and given a new life and a new hope, I was deserving of whatever that criminal was receiving, whatever pain, whatever tormentation, whatever um, hurt, I was all those things and deserving of dying because of my sin. Mm -hmm. And so Peyton chose this topic and I thought, what a fitting time because it had to be a chaotic time, not only in the, the city itself, but in this man's life because he had nothing to keep him constant or steady. And praise be to God that Peyton and I both have that new hope that Jesus heard our cry and said, please, Abba, Jesus, take us with you into paradise. And Jesus' response was, yes, I will. And so I want to encourage us as a, uh, as a sisterhood, a brotherhood, a church, that 
we hold on to that hope, especially during this time where we see so much death and uncertainty about the future, that remember we are rescued. We are um, a people that Jesus chose to be in his glory. And so that gives me hope to continue day after day because of him and because of that new hope. Thanks for letting us share.
hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it here You left the grave behind you so will I I can see your heart in everything you've everyone. I'm going to share a few thoughts with you for the contribution. I've selected a scripture out of Matthew 13, and it's one we all know. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went away and sold everything he had and bought that field. And that's kind of how I look at the church. It's a, it's a treasure of great value. And so when we think about contribution, you know, we're, we've got something of great value and we want to keep it going. And so we can actually participate in keeping this great treasure going by contributing to the work of the church, by paying the staff, um, by, you know, programs and stuff for our children. It's a great opportunity. And I know we've all been kind of cooped up with the quarantine, but uh, we can still be generous. And I thought I'd serenade you, or at least attempt to, with a little song that I've been working on since I've been stuck at home.